Cal. And, uh, thank you everyone for coming to sit here on such a beautiful day. Um, so I'm Lena Nelson. I'm a chemical engineer by training, then turned biomedical engineer, and finally material science engineer. For those engineers in the audience who kind of want insight on where my perspectives come from. Uh, I work now at the Blum Center for Developing Economies, which is an interdisciplinary hub here on campus for understanding and acting on global poverty and inequality. And when we say global, we include California. So last time I checked, we're on the globe. Um, and before I start, I just want to do a quick shout out. I'm going to talk about a lot of work that I've done, but also even more work that other people in our networks have done. So here are some of the, the, the lowest and places where you can find out more, particularly uh, at the Blum Center site and at the Development Impact Lab site, which is an initiative we run with federal funding from USAID. And that's really, um, I think, an excellent example of the federal government uh, thinking outside of the normal frameworks of how they work. And, giving us an opportunity to do something really new and I think really great uh, here at UC Berkeley. Uh, definitely not just business as usual. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of framing for some slides and then until we run out of time I'll be giving specific <coughs> examples of some of the, the cool stuff we're doing, I think, uh, to take technology and use it uh, to make the world a better place. Um, it's really exciting to be here in the sense that Normally, I give talks about things. I think most scientists and researchers give talks about things we talk about all the time. You, know, you have your slide deck and you reshuffle the images and you give a thousand talks. But this is literally the first time that all of this has come together uh, in a big public presentation. So I'm really, really excited for you to be here and hopefully ask some good questions. We just launched this big new initiative last month Development Engineering. Um, it is whole new PhD field of study at UC Berkeley, but we're also working with partners at a range of other universities, from MIT to Makerere in Uganda to IIT in India. Um, and beyond the classes and the courses that we think will enable and allow students to tackle problems that they're really passionate about, not just basic research, but taking basic research and translating it um, into applied work that really makes a difference. In addition to that, there is uh, hundreds of faculty, over 100 faculty, working with us um, on research initiatives that in different ways, I think, are going to directly impact um, the way cities are built across the globe, the way rural communities get access to the things we have access here. Sometimes engineers tell me that it all seems a little fluffy, this whole idea of engineering for social good, and what does that really mean? Is that really hardcore engineering or not? And this is a chart I show them then. The idea that engineering has always been a response to societal changes and societal changes in the way we look at the world, more specifically, uh, from uh, aerospace engineering coming after the Wright brothers to maybe uh, the greatest example, uh, environmental engineering in the 1960s, how societal movements in different forms spur different ways of engineers framing the problems and the types of challenges we tackle. And I, in the Blum Center, post that today we have a generation of millennials who want to make a difference. We have an increased awareness of how the world is intimately connected and how things that happen in other places affect us here today. And just a sense of global citizenship students and researchers of all stripes, and we are now working to put this all together under the umbrella of development engineering. It's a combination of theory and action. Another question that's often asked as well, is this just taking cheap, quick gadgets and putting them out there in the world to see what happens? Is it kind of hand-me-down products, or is it really cutting the age research? But it definitely is an opportunity, I think, not just for engineers who really care about making the world better, hopefully they do, but in addition, there is a treasure trove of interesting and exciting research and engineering to be done when we start looking outside of Silicon Valley and the traditional engineering projects. It's also a perfect intersection of UC Berkeley's mission, which is teaching research and public service, all coming together in one place. Importantly, it's not just engineering. Uh, it's a mix of research from all over campus. The idea being that engineering um, has to happen in 
any context to be meaningful for society. You don't have to read all of this. The idea is just that we're building up a set of methodologies that incorporates thinking from social sciences, from anthropology, um, from engineering, of course, from, from um, economics and from business to create um, products, services, approaches that hopefully are going to be more meaningful than they would be on their own. It takes them work not just at the lab bench, uh, but beyond that. It's been going on for a long time, in a sense. The seminal book on the topic is called Small is Beautiful. It was written in 1973. But it hasn't really taken hold in academia. We hadn't codified what it really means to do engineering with a lens completely on social impact, not on financial benefit, not on understanding the world in different ways. Um, so that challenge is still ahead, and I think that's what our goal is here, by putting together all these researchers um, to work together. And as I wrap up this kind of framing of what I think it is we're all doing, and why, even though I'm going to talk about a specific example, there's something big and cool and, and beautiful behind that, I have a small pitch here for the academics in the room. We're also going to be launching an academic journal where you can publish this stuff. And for the non-academics in the room, um, why this is important, even though it doesn't seem like it might be, is that if you want to do something um, big and new, we also have to make sure that we align with how academic incentives work currently at the university. If professors can't publish, then they're not going to be able to do the work, right? If PhD students can't get their thesis on doing it, if there's no PhD curriculum, no minor like we're creating, then they cannot use their university time to think about these problems. So some of what we're doing is just providing the context and the space for people to work on the problems they want to work on already, but maybe aren't able to get the academic credit they need for doing. And then, of course, in addition to those mechanisms, called push mechanisms, there's the pull mechanisms, just making the opportunities available and visible. So showing engineers, like me, <laughs> what are worthwhile problems to really work on. A little bit by the numbers. We're just starting out, but as you see, I'm not just talking about something I'm doing in my little lab <laughs> with no one else really caring. It's the beginning of a movement at UC Berkeley, I think, and hopefully beyond that. 500 students is only 5% of the student population. But if you think about us starting this within the last year, I think it's pretty impressive where we're going. It's pretty clear that there's a desire among young people here to chart these new horizons. Um, some of the things I'm going to show as I move on in my presentation is affecting millions of people in profound ways. Others are technologies and ideas that maybe affect just a few. <laughs> And I want to call it out explicitly and make the point that the role of the university is not to scale to touch a million people, it's to envision new ways that we can shape the world, right? It's to come up with those new approaches. So we're not, we're handing things off, and I will talk about some of those before it's really um, something big. Um, but also, some of these ideas are never going to be made, right? That's the nature of the approaches. Um, but I want to just note that that doesn't really matter in a way. Part of our business is not just creating these technologies and these services and all this engineering, but it's training a generation of engineers to see the world differently. It's the idea that when you come out of UC Berkeley as an engineer, no matter where you go, whether it's a large established traditional engineering firm, a big bank, or a tiny NGO, or a social enterprise, you're going to be driven by social mission and a sense of global citizenry. Um, and finally, of course, even though I'm going to talk about places where technology has been able to have uh, a very positive role, particularly thinking about technology that incorporates cultural, social, economic, um, and other contexts, <laughs> and really think about how they work uh, in complex situations across the globe, there are many places where technology has no role. So this is an example of that, and um, the details maybe not not what's important, but as the specific example is, in Sub-Saharan Africa, 70% of people don't have electricity. Um, we had a huge project planned for Kenya, 
from the conventional wisdom from the International Energy Agency and many other big international uh, thought leaders is that the only way to get energy affordably to a large number of people is microgrids. So independent small uh, systems of energy, one of the solar panel or of, of water, um, that hydro, that can function just in a small village, 20 houses, 100 houses, let's say. There's huge international efforts to do this. So researchers in Berkeley would in and say, you know what, we have great ideas on affordable smart meters so we can figure out how to do payment models where people can prepay a dollar at a time, the kind of solutions that make a grid sustainable in a place where people are making $2.50 a day or less. The team went to Kenya and it turns out that in spite of all um, the white papers and the thought leaderships, 50% um, of the households that they measured in tax 20,000 houses were within two, out of those 20,000 houses, 50% were within 200 feet of the power grid that they could connect to. So it turns out that when you go out and you really see what the world looks like, the problem wasn't at all that there needed to be more microgrids in faraway rural places. It was that there was a lack of policy, there was a lot of political will to let houses connect to grids that were already there. So that's an example where we thought we had this great technology solution, but really the challenge was somewhere else. Um, so the team now still had the silver lining of technology, of uh, refocusing their efforts first on, on, on highlighting the issues so that policies can be, be changed, putting pressure on that, putting in subsidies and financial models so that people will be able to afford to connect to the grid, but also doing clever things like letting people download a small app where you can then measure from afar if the phone is charging or not. This is then a way to see if people are getting electricity or not in existing grids which don't have power a lot of the time. So in the same setting as they're rolling out, just connecting to existing grids, they're just asking people, you know, hey, can you turn on, turn, download this app? Because people have smartphones everywhere in the world, it turns out. Um, there are more smartphones. There are more people with smartphones in Africa than the people with light bulbs at home. So smartphones is a good measure of whether you're getting electricity in your house or not. So this team, um, are basically then remotely measuring whether energy access is really happening in places that now should be connected to the grid just by saying, can we detect people charging their phones or not? And definitely, if no one is charging their phone, they don't have electricity because it's the number one first thing people do when they get energy access. So here, a small clever twist, I think, on where the technology fits in, where at first there were grand plans of rolling out whole new energy systems, and in the end, the solution that's more me most meaningful for affecting policymakers was a small app on cell phone. One might then ask, well, okay, so that's a case where they're doing great things now, but clearly the framing of the problem is totally wrong to begin with. Maybe it isn't right that researchers at Berkeley should be asked trying to solve these problems at all. Should these problems be solved locally? So maybe that the most powerful way because people who are living in a place are the ones that understand these contexts. I bet a lot of people in those villages would have been able to answer this question fairly quickly if they had just been asked in the right way. So here's a few slides explaining what, why I think Berkeley has um, a role in part. This is a, a regular map of the world you've probably seen many times. This is a map of the world we scaled for in the cases of trachoma. It's, a dead, it's an eye disease that will lead to black blindness if not treated. But it can be treated for a few cents if you just have, know you have it. So it is, in theory, a very easy medical problem to solve. If you get trachoma, it's called in the eye, it can be treated for dollars. And it can be treated for cents in most of the world. But if you don't have the ability to diagnosis, you don't have the do the diagnosis, if you don't have the ability to get the drug there, then there's no treatment. So I can show chart after chart after chart like this on pretty much any medical condition you want to pick, different metrics of economic disadvantage and so on, um, showing where the problems are globally. But let's look at another map. Let's look at this map. Where are the resources? Where's the funding? Where are the people with the training and the expertise? Where, is, um, the, where are the support systems to develop new technologies? And all of a sudden, the world looks very different. 
And I think because we have these resources, we have an obligation, frankly, to try to do something about some of these questions and issues. And that doesn't mean that we should be solving them here and exporting uh, our ways of thinking and being, but that means that we should, like all the researchers I'm going to talk uh, about today, we should be partnering with others internationally to try to solve these issues. So all of these researchers are working with doctors, with communities, with engineers in countries international with, to make sure that problems are framed, framed the right way, that we're uh, not forgetting about the policy makers and the governments and the NGOs already there and all of the different uh, infrastructure problems and so on. And to put a number on all of this, just here from UC Berkeley, this is the UC Berkeley research budget for last year. This is how much money we have that's available for us. Multi federal money, don't worry if you're paying tuition, this is not tuition money and it's not state funds. But these are the research capabilities that could be leveraged to also try to make the world better. Some of that clearly is, but some of it is basic research that could need one more translation step to be something really powerful um, for people who really need it. Um, so I think we're sitting on a treasure trove of capability that has not systematically um, been looked at under the lens of how can we use this for what I call global social good. Are you all with me? Any questions? Burning questions? I can take questions at the end too, but feel free to raise your hand uh, if you want to break uh, the sound of my voice. <laughs> uh, with all that kind of general framing of why we are putting a lot of time and a lot of effort into all of this, and, um, I'm going to go through eight examples. Four of them led by faculty, traditional way to do research here, big faculty projects, with lots of grad students and postdocs, and four technologies that have been independently developed just by student teams. And I think in that latter case, maybe it's a sign that we are as a university moving slower than our students are in wanting to do this. And so much of the really successful innovation and creativity is happening with an independent student team. Next slide, I promise. I'm going to start with the first real example, but a quick uh, caveat. Um, that first example is on a smartphone-enabled microscope. And I am, for that example and the ones that follow, I'm going to be showing kind of the big picture and the pretty images, but of course behind that, uh, there's the stuff on the left, uh, the hard equations, the rigorous hours in the lab, the engineering, the math, uh, and all that science, but in the interest of kind of highlighting and really bringing out the big whys and how it works. Um, that's not in here, but I want to acknowledge for anyone who's still thinking about going to college, focus on the stuff on the left. <laughs> so here's the first one. Here's one I've spent a lot of time working on, so I welcome any detailed questions afterward. Um, Smartphone-enabled diagnostics or low-resource point-of-care clinics. This is basically a like a version of a couple of existing technology trends. LEDs, so lights. Um, used to be that microscopes were all made with fluorescence bulbs. That's the way to see a lot of the dyes that are really standard to use. The problem with a fluorescent light bulb is that you need really clean power, so you can't use it anywhere that's not the US or Europe almost. <laughs> if you have voltage spikes and power goes out, you're out hundreds of dollars and you have mercury spill. We said there's no reason to do that anymore because there are, as you saw with the Nobel Prizes this year, very high powerful, very effective LED lights in different colors that can be used. So we swapped that out. Um, we also took advantage of the fact that you can now 3D print and laser cutting and all such a really advanced prototyping in lab. That means that in a 24 hour cycle today, you can have a whole new prototype that essentially is exactly the same as with the manufactured version would be rather than kind of jerry-rigging something that you put together sort of kind of looks like it should be, this allows you to have sub-millimeter precision in how you weigh things out and do that in a really rapid way. So that's something else that's really transformative, I think, in the ability for technology at a university to be really relevant in these very applied um, problems. And then finally, another interesting technology twist um, that this product is taking advantage of is that um, can piggyback off of the ubiquity of technology today. 
Um, the camera in an Apple smartphone has seven different layers of lenses. It's a high precision uh, piece of machinery. You don't quite expect it. If I were to buy that here in the lab just on its own, it might cost me $500 to get some of equivalent. Apple obviously buys millions and pays a couple of dollars. So we're piggybacking either by taking whole phones or off of the production streams of these big manufacturers to get really high quality components at a really, really low price. Um, the other thing you get with a smartphone today is it used to be a computer a few years ago, right? Which means that although this body was driven by this idea that you could do diagnosis somewhere really uh, remote for someone who had tuberculosis or malaria, let's say, and send those images to a doctor, an expert, somewhere far away, um, that model has already become somewhat outdated for us because it turns out that the smartphone is your doctor. The smartphone itself can do the, the machine learning, have the machine learning algorithms on it to do the automated diagnosis and pop out an answer. Here are some of the different things you can use it for. And so we've looked at all kinds of medical applications in lots of different countries. Um, eye diseases, malaria, tuberculosis, pap smears, opening up basically the capabilities of a medical research lab from a hospital into the point of care settings that doesn't have electricity, that doesn't have the infrastructure or medical training that you find in a big hospital. The biggest take home of this project, I think, is that it's all about uh, collaboration and all about partnership, which I mentioned a little bit before as well, but I want to highlight it again because it's so fundamentally important and I think the biggest place where some of these projects uh, go wrong. Um, the biggest implementation of Salesforce is for tuberculosis. It's being used right now, so it's not commercially available, but it's used in 61 health clinics in northern Vietnam and Hanoi province that's serving hundreds of thousands of people. And that's obviously only possible by partnering with medical professionals in all kinds of countries, actually, to do all the R&D and all of the user testing. So this is something that wouldn't have been possible before, but now are, right? And I can get on a conference call every week with the medical doctors in India and share those images and discuss how things work and really understand at a deeper level what it really is like for the average doctor on an average workday. And that's our approach even makes sense, which of course I did at first. But now I think it hopefully um, does. Um, another interesting take home from this project is that breakthroughs happen when completely new problem solvers are brought in. And this I think is another really important point about why I think engineers should be looking at all these different challenges. It's not necessarily always that engineers have a better answer than an anthropologist or a social scientist or the practitioners in different fields. It's that always bringing in, that bringing in new people often unleashes some new insight or angle that can prove powerful. And so this example, um, for this automated diagnosis, uh, of being able to do tuberculosis diagnostics on the phone, at first we thought it was impossible. We can't do it. I actually spent several weeks looking at the literature and who has tried it before, not on a phone even, but using a powerful computer, and all the published literatures were sort of like, yeah, we kind of did it a little bit, it sort of worked, but you probably wouldn't want your doctor using it. But still took the problem to uh, the Malik lab in electrical engineering, it's a lab that does very advanced uh, auto, uh, uh, image detection, so visualizations, facial expressions, and that kind of thing. And said, you know, hey, we got these images, and we really like to do some automated detection on this, and we really need, but I don't really think it can be done. Just look at all this literature that says, you know, it's really, really hard. Uh, and Malik said, yeah, sure, you know, I'll put one master student on it for four months, and we'll see what happens. So I went out of there, and I thought, well, that was ridiculous. He clearly thinks this is a waste of time, and this isn't going to work. Uh, but it turned out that's not at all what he thought. He thought, this is such an easy problem, that's all we need. <laughs> Because the thing is, um, no one else who had tried to solve this problem had been coming at it from doing the kind of problems like recognizing someone's facial expression when they're walking down uh, the subway and they're being captured by the camera, right? Really complicated, advanced image recognition uh, problems. And I come in with a black field with a bunch of green dots. 
That just seems trivial, right? <laughs> um, and so I think these are the kind of connections that you can have happen when you combine then engineers with uh, groups with other expertise you would normally see. So in this set, one reason that engineers like Mollick can never try to do this before because if you're gonna do is because if they're doing machine learning algorithm, you obviously need something for the machine to learn on. And what Fletcher's lab where I worked at was a set of 800 images that had been annotated by Dr. Sugugano, so images of patients with and without TV. So there was something there for the machine to learn from. And once it did, that algorithm, that machine, could outperform any doctor we had working on our team. Yeah? What is the pattern you're showing up where it was green So, so oh, sorry, that's not clear. So the green patterns are, um, each one is a tuberculosis bacillus. So if you have tuberculosis, that will be all over your lungs. So the standard diagnostic is that the person will cough onto a slide, basically, and a uh, uh, physician will look at that, that slide under a microscope and try to find those green dots. But those are sorted. In reality, you will have this huge black image and you zoom in on lots of different little green dots and maybe there's tons of background noise because so there's tons of different stuff in your lungs that will be dyed and colored. So the doctor has to look at all the different ones and say, oh, this one kind of has the shape of TB or this one doesn't, and determine then, based on that, if you have tuberculosis or not. That's not how anyone here in this room would be diagnosed. If you go to a doctor here, there's PCR, polymerase chain reaction, a very advanced technique that requires lots of steps and refrigeration and expensive reagents, etc. But most of the world, uh, uses this methodology, and one third of all the people on the planet have uh, latent tuberculosis. So this is what most of humanity gets to do. And so the question then is, it's, it looks easy to, to tell the difference between the positive, the first row, and the negative, that the no tuberculosis there, because the machine has sorted it. But in reality, it's quite hard, which means that tuberculosis diagnosis can only happen in big cities. But not everyone who has tuberculosis lives in a big city, right? And not everyone who's coughing is going to make a big trip into a big city to do that coughing test, right? So having this automated, having this small device, the cell scope, and the automated diagnosis lets you use that in some in any rural point of care clinic that doesn't have all that expertise and training um, and ability to do the big test manually. And frankly, with this algorithm, even a big hospital doesn't have to have a doctor do it, right? So the doctor would then kind of, you know, if I ask one of the doctors who talk to you, well, what do you look for? They might say, well, you know, it's kind of elongated, but it's not longer than this long, it's not shorter than this, about, you know. But the machine learning algorithm has 18 different parameters it's looking at very precisely, and I said a very specific confidence interval, right? You can take all that subconscious information you might have looking at that image and really quantify that in a way that's scalable and you control. Does that make sense? Um, all right. So what's the possibility of this ending up in the iTunes app store? Why can't I get out and say something like, you know, people revolt or something, you know, and then I can take a bunch of photos of something I just sped up and it will give me a percentage standard. Have I got, you know, cold or have I got? There is a version in the App Store. <laughs> uh, not focusing on medical applications though, but if you wanted to to look at your pond water or a piece of paper or things around you in the world. Sure. Yeah. Is it called Salsco? Huh? Is it, is yes. it the app Yes. But the first step is is taking the sample and putting it under a microscope and coloring it, etc., etc. That may not be so easily done either. So, yeah, so the microscope part here is also then integrated. You get rid of the microscope. Basically, then the smartphone becomes your microscope. It has that camera. You add one other cheap lens, and there you are. What we're basically saying there is this is this is a simple small part. It's just saying the standard microscope that you buy is made to do all kinds of microscopy. Kind of by definition, it's a microscope that's microscope microscopy, kind of all kinds. But what we are doing with the cell scope in the Fletcher lab is 
stripping it of everything that doesn't have to do with tuberculosis, say, or whatever the application is. So any lens, component, optics part, all those expensive things <laughs> that are part of it, we just strip it out. We can just, each version can just do one thing. Now, for tuberculosis, you had a question about kind of the general applicability. There are some things, there are a lot of things that can be done on the same, on the same platform. And then you wouldn't have to switch. You know, so we strip everything you don't need for something like tuberculosis. It's just really hard and really expensive to do. Cost is a big factor. This is kind of the hardest use case. There are other things that are really easy, or you might not even need um, any fancy microscopy at all. What's the uh, resolution limits of this instrument? Diffraction. See viruses? No, you won't see viruses. So it's limited. So, well, in theory, all, all microscopes are limited by the wavelength of light, right? So you can't see anything less than, unless you do a little bit of data manipulation trickery, which was a Nobel Prize also this year, not from here, but somewhere else. But unless you do that, you can't see anything that's smaller than half the wavelength of light. So that's a couple hundred nanometers. So it's something that was smaller than that, you wouldn't see. Yeah, that's the limits. Yeah, that's the limits. But that's the case whether your instrument, you know, my ref the reference instrument that in the Fletcher Laboratory costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. It has the same issue, right? So as this thing does. So that's <coughs> just uh, the basic science question. It's not about our affordability. I have two questions about this app. Um, yeah. I support um, a charitable group called um, Moms on Missions of Service. They train midwives in Sierra Leone. Temporarily unable to do that because of Ebola, of course, but hopefully when that passes, they'll be able to go back. Their main mission is, in fact, midwife training of the local women. It seems to me that an app like that, and they do carry iPads and laptops with them when they go in there. So it looks to me that something like this, if it could be rolled out uh, first to the Americans who go in there, and if they could then leave behind this app for the women that they train, they could expand their focus beyond just midwifery in, into a local diagnosis of local problems. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, those kind of approaches definitely sound reasonable. And there's also other applications that are not tuberculosis that are closest, closer at hand, like pap smears. Is, is, there, is there some training group that you know <laughs> of that, that would work with NGOs and, and mission groups like this that would help them roll that out? train them, teach them how to use it? Yeah, so uh, all of these, when this is rolled out for any disease, there's definitely always a training program that goes with, and there's a small just study first, and then a bigger rollout to ensure that's how it works. Okay, yeah. cool. And the se my second question is, uh, I know that there's an ongoing uh, internet-based uh, project that anyone can, can sign up for to look at complex protein folds. Right. Uh, to, to, to various kinds of medical diagnosis, because Hitherto, it's been said that the human recognition is better than the machine recognition. Could this app be turned to that purpose, looking at complex protein folds? Right, so that's David Baker at the University of Washington. Fold it is that application where you can play with folded proteins, potentially find solutions a computer wouldn't, right? Um, there are definitely people doing, doing kind of a reverse here, and we have explored it too, so that people would look at images and, and try to find different types of features. Um, with the medical application, there's also things, that, there's some differences there about privacy, about what are the repercussions if you're wrong, etc. So it has some different challenges than the medical project does. But I think the basic concept is the same. I'm not, the point I'm making is not just, the, it's not that machines are better, it's that it's powerful to look at a problem from a whole different angle. David Baker did the same thing, kind of turned around, right? He took a problem that normally would only be solved with uh, clusters of 500 computers or more, and he said, well, what about one human brain? <laughs> Cell phone coverage for people in rural communities that don't have it yet. So, 
although most people have a cell phone, it turns out that many of them on the planet, it turns out that many of them don't have cell phone coverage. That's a totally separate problem that's underappreciated. So many people have a phone that's essentially um, an MP3 player and a camera. One billion people without cell phone coverage. Um, and part of the problem here is, is that the traditional telecoms, your Verizon's and AT&T's across the globe, won't go certain places because it's not profitable to do that. Right? You have to put a cell phone tower up every so many kilometers, and that just doesn't make financial sense to do. So what this team uh, that works in the Development Effect Lab at Berkeley have done is strip the cost down in order of magnitude uh, by doing some fun Pretty, I mean, some of them obvious tricks once you think about it. This average cell phone tower is made uh, in manufacturers to serve places like San Francisco, where you have lots and lots of people. You need to have the capacity to have thousands of phone calls going through the same tower at once. That's obviously not true if you're in a tiny small village, not, not a lot around it, right? So you can scale down a lot of the capabilities of each individual tower to make it affordable on the scale of a small poor village not a gigantic city uh, in the United States. Uh, you can also do clever things like um, turn it off of different types. So they have a service, they have something they call the wake up radio. They basically say, well, look at your usage patterns and between these hours at night, people aren't using it. The biggest cost by far of running a cell phone tower is power. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna basically put the cell phone tower to sleep <laughs> And you have the ability to wake it up for emergency calls and for incoming calls, and that's it. But it's not just standing there waiting for you to take, uh, take a call. Did you say emergency? Uh, did you say it would take it? Yeah, so it would take incoming SMSs at all times, and incoming calls. Oh. So it can be wake, woken up automatically by that. But if you want to call out from that village, you have to either do that with uh, uh, calling a wake up radio or whatever they push to do it. But then you have a cell phone tower, in this case, that runs on 25 watt instead of 100 plus. So it's a massive cost reduction. In addition to the cost, it just makes it feasible in general to run it up with things such as solar power or hydro, micro hydro kind of approaches. If you're not on a big grid, you just don't have a lot of power to use, right? So in um, the first use case in Papua Indonesia, they were running it off of um, uh, a, a small. Um, solar power system, so there just wasn't more power, so you couldn't have put in anything else uh, without a massive infrastructure upgrade for energy. For whoever's interested in, in, in having a bit more of the engineering, I know there's different audiences on so <laughs> wanting more or, or less of the details. I think one other cool place where engineering really Holds in with policy is uh, this works really well. Uh, you can actually show that right away. In the first, very first pilots, after six months, we had 500,000 SMS and phone messages in a place that had none before. The school that's running it, the community school that, that now owns that cell phone tower, is making a thousand dollars a month uh, off of it, which is a huge sum of money where they're at. Um, it has all kinds of positive side effects, like the retention on non local teachers who wouldn't normally want to go work at that school and stay. Uh, the reason they're staying seems to be that now you can go on Facebook. <coughs> Facebook usage by far is the number one thing people want to do when they're spending with. Uh, and, and, huh? It ain't Indonesia. <laughs> yep, yep, turns out. It was to the surprise of all the researchers. There were grand plans of educational programs and uh, <coughs> community radio shows and so on, but the outcome was the people didn't want that, they wanted Facebook, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, and this is now just now, uh, last month, but now it is a for profit, one of the former graduate students from Berkeley, uh, Curtis Henry. Uh, but then, back then, so with that big success that that really works, um, it turns out that even though now in theory, for less than $10,000 or $5,000, you can put up your own cell phone network, um, which we do here sometimes at Berkeley, you call each other directly on your own network without ever going through Verizon or ATT or anything else. Um, so you could do that to bring cell phone coverage to anywhere in the world, in theory, just about. Um, it turns out that big telecoms in most of the world own all the spectrum licenses. So 
They might not be using it, but governments hand out spectrum licenses, just like TV stations have spectrum, so they, they, um, where they uh, broadcast. That's the same for cell phone coverage. So there's just nowhere where you can legally do that communication. So one really neat technology that can come out for the second level uh, of this whole project um, is um, a way to use the white space, the non-used bandwidth from the telecoms. So the way that works is, right, even though a telecom might own it, they aren't using it most of the time. It's just sitting there waiting that maybe someone will call, right? It might be only 10% capacity or 20. But the telecoms don't want to give it up because what if something big happens, right? What if there's this huge event and all of a sudden everyone's making a phone call, then they want to have that capacity. So policy-wise, they're not interested at all in changing the law so that other people can potentially infringe on those same also use this same, um, that same spectrum, the same ability to reach customers. Um, so what all these little green and, and red and blue dots mean um, is that they set up a system where you can then make calls on someone else's spectrum in green um, and then have the technology to detect when that main owner of that spectrum, the big telecom, all of a sudden needs all of it and then you back off. So that there's no interference. If you just did it and you didn't have a way to see what the big telecom was doing, then um, you could potentially have a situation right where you were preventing that telecom from operating, which is more higher paying customers. But here there's a way now, a technological way to really cleverly say, hey, whenever you're not using it, we're on it, but as soon as you need it, we're immediately off. And you'll never know we were. So that's then potentially a technology solution that will allow policymakers in some of the places where you couldn't do this currently to um, change the rules. So just an example of how complicated it all is <laughs> and how some of the solutions is just you just have to come up with a technology and make sure it works in that context and you're kind of good to go. But in other cases, there's just a complex history of what the rules are and the regulations, so who's already working in a particular space maybe even a fear from existing companies and groups of what it means to fundamentally change the way the industry works, right? It could be potentially scary if you're a big telecom if everyone you're not serving now, but you know, you kind of might want to serve in 10 years, five years, if they all start setting up their own cell phone networks. You know, what does that mean for the future of your business? So how do you mitigate that so we can all play nicely together? <coughs> I'm running out of time, so I'm going to just show a few select ones. What if you were a nurse and once the sun set, you had to care for Ebola patients in total darkness? And that's how it happens, right? Those clinics don't have energy. Out of many problems that those clinics are facing, right? This is, I think, a really, really beautiful project um, by a researcher here. We care solar, solar suitcases, optimized for the kind of equipment you might have in a basic hospital or in a hospital for lighting. So that you can do some really basic things. So Laura Stachio um, started this project first coming in as an opt-in op for, for maternal health, going in and saying, you know, I can come in and I can do surgeries and I can help with births and I can help improve techniques. But what she found was that um, in the country she was visiting, the clinic she was working, what really was the biggest problem was that it's pitch black half the day. If you were giving birth that part of the day, there's no ability for anyone to help you. And so she started this organization, We Care Solar, here out of UC Berkeley, doing the research and R&D for these optimized solar panels for maternity wards. And now this year, they're taking them to Liberia to also work with Ebola patients, recognizing that the need to have lighting to do basic care um, spreads much further than maternity wards. So they're going to Liberia with that. And uh, it has been a logistic nightmare, I think getting them there, <laughs> just to show that, again, it's not just about the engineering, it's about the supply chains and all the logistics and everything that goes with it. I want to take 
last few minutes to just highlight the student uh, portion of this. Um, I've been talking about big research projects, the stuff that takes five years, ten years to really come to fruition and be something that impacts real people in the real world. Um, on a shorter time scale uh, and on a different kind of creativity, we also have the Big Ideas at Berkeley competition. That's about 700 students every year taking part across a lot of diverse categories. It's really cool. We have regular techie ones like clean energy and IT for society, but also things like creative expression for social justice. So it really makes of students just recognizing that great ideas come from everywhere. And there's power in bringing students from all across campus. Last year, I think there was 80 different departments that participated. Um, and this year, there's 500,000 students eligible for at least one category. Because so many other universities have wanted to take part, and we can't say no. <laughs> um, it's really neat because it's not a business plan competition. It's a creativity and vision competition. So it's not about can you make money off of this, it's about have you figured out a different way to see the world and a way that you can make a difference. So we have, for example, we materials, new tech in an old industry. One billion people live in slums worldwide, a hundred million of them are in India, making less than two dollars a day. And housing is a major issue. And some would argue a human right, a safe place to live, spend your days. If this is kind of what it would look up close up uh, in many slums around the world. The leaking asbestos roofs <laughs> that cost more than people really can afford to spend. This uh, group of students started a company. They did the R&D here at UC Berkeley, starting with less than $5,000 investments for big ideas at Berkeley. And now they've gone on to, to, to get a whole lot more than that. And it looks something like this kind of like a Lego approach to roofing. <laughs> um, you can just put those small modular pieces um, together to have a waterproof roof that's made from recycled materials. So local cardboard that's been covered with a waterproof sealant. Uh, the, another one is next drops, managing utilities and pipes without water. Um, when we think about people not having water uh, globally, we often think about people just having to walk really far to a well, perhaps. But the truth is that most people living in cities don't have access to water either. That's because water, there's not enough water available. There are pipes, but there's not enough water. So utilities pick neighborhoods so where the water should go. Today, it's South Berkeley. Tomorrow, it's North Oakland, and so on. And you have to sit and wait. Someone in your household will have to sit and wait. Probably someone's mom sits and waits until the water is in. It's running in those pipes and collect that in big canisters. That happens all over the world for millions of people. Next drop doesn't think that they can solve that problem. That's rooted and intrinsic and it's going to take a long time. But what they are doing is offering a small phone service where you get a text message that warns you one hour before your water turns on. That way you don't have to sit at home and just wait for that water to come. And you can go about your day as you need until it happens. On the other end, it also provides ability for utilities to see what's really happened. Because most of these same utilities have no idea, frankly, uh, where water is being supplied or not. Is it really working with those valve men or turn the pipe to go in the neighborhood? Or is there some big leak somewhere where that water is just dumping somewhere? Or is the valve men even turning that knob or not? being done manually across cities everywhere. Um, so then they have the second customer and the utilities for the first time are getting feedback. This is included in India with 75,000 customers to date. They're getting feedback on, well, what is really working and what isn't? And not surprisingly, there are surprises <laughs> in how that all works. Um, another one, Copio just got bought up a Fair Trade USA you say that's management of uh, coffee. Most of the coffee in the world is dumping 80% uh, by smallholder farmers that are getting fair prices in part because they aren't able to document how much they really have and at what time and they're really optimized to international prices and when their coffee is being sold and, will, yeah, and at, in a way where they're documenting what the quality is. So they're putting that power in the hands of that original coffee farmer new IT interfaces. And to uh, wrap it all up, one from back home. 
back to the roots. I call it a step toward the circular economy of reusing materials uh, that we need uh, in a closed loop rather than anything ending up in the uh, landfill. Um, the problem then identified is we're all drinking a lot of coffee. Eight million tons of coffee, probably a fair chunk in the bay. Uh, and they had uh, a small kit to grow mushrooms out of that. <laughs> you can now buy, I see, even at uh, Sky Mall. <laughs> and Whole Foods, Home Depot, uh, and many other places uh, nationwide. And that's uh, my big fast tour of all the interesting tech, engineering, and science, like Back to the Roots, uh, happening at UC Berkeley, all driven by a mission to make the world better. And I'll just end by saying, I hope you participate by spreading the word and telling people we're doing this and that they should take part, that you come and volunteer your time and expertise. Because I think a big part of this is making it not just an academic exercise, but something really connected to communities, to people with knowledge and expertise uh, from their work and from their lives. Um, and then to learn more and keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. 